Let's talk about death. Yes. The cycle of life. Like, what does this have to do with, what does what being a mindful carnivore have to do with death? My first response would be, it has everything to do with death. <laughs> with life and death. Tovar Saruli, author of The Mindful Carnivore, A Vegetarian's Hunt for Sustenance. There's a great line from uh, Joseph Campbell, who once said that the essence of life is that it lives by killing and eating. That's the nature of reality and existence and life. So I think that the question of food and eating has everything to do with life and death. And our illusion that they're separate is, I think, culturally specific. There are cultures that do not have that illusion. But we, in modern Western culture, are pretty divorced from them. We've forgotten how direct that relationship is between life and death and food, you know, life, food, death. Except in some abstract, you know, disnified circle of life, Lion King <laughs> sort of mythology. Except for that, we, we don't really experience it much, most of us. Before I started this journey, I was one of those that had distanced myself from life, death, and food, except in an abstract Lion King way. It took a plate of soggy chicken fingers at a dive bar in Alphabet City to see the connection. In part one of Eating Eyes Open, I set out on an expedition to eliminate death from my diet. But I soon discovered it's not that easy. With the help of a radical feminist slash food activist, I learned about the vegetarian myth. How, because of the ecological destruction of industrial agriculture, I wasn't preventing the death of animals merely by eating a vegetable-only diet. Nor do I receive an automatic good ethics badge just for being a vegan. And when I turned towards the future of cellular agriculture, a meat historian set me straight. We are nowhere near fixing the world's problem of meat overconsumption with science. And that maybe the answer lies not in technology, but in restraint. Then, with the help of a Hawaiian farm coach and a Polish poet, I discovered an ethos that has guided me here, to my first hunting trip. But is hunting the most ecologically benign way to feed myself? And if it is, could I pull the trigger? Or should I just say the hell with it and go out and find a local symbiotic farm? So many questions. Please join me as I continue the adventure and attempt to answer them all. Beginning in Vermont, exploring hunting mindfulness with Tovar Cerulli, then off to Seattle for more education with hunting celebrity Stephen Ronella, and finally into the mountains of Idaho with a couple more mosses and a German banker in part two of Eating Eyes Open. From the Jones Story Company, this is The Adventures of Memento Mori, a cynic's guide for learning to live by remembering to die. The podcast that explores mortality. Here's your host, D.S. Moss. It's the morning of the second day. Yesterday, we saw uh, like four does and a buck, and we chased them all day. My knees hurt, my ankles hurt, but we're back today. I'm not really hiking anywhere, so I say. And it's also raining. Which actually feels kind of nice. Great place to meditate, too. It's pretty beautiful out here. Out for now. The biggest thing is where you hit it. You want to hit the animal through the lungs. A lot of guys will shoot for the shoulder because when you shoot through the shoulder, you're going to destroy the lungs as well, and the animal's going to fall and die very quickly, but you lose a lot of shoulder meat. I tend to shoot back from the shoulder, pr preferably, you know, there's all kinds of human error that goes on, but preferably shoot a couple inches back from the shoulder, 
through the lungs. The animal's dead in seconds, and you don't lose a lot of meat. It's a, it's a humane way of doing it. In preparation for my hunt, I read a book called The Mindful Carnivore, and the author and I share a, um, how can I say, existential sensitivity. As a teenager, I had vegetarian friends, and when I was 20, I was really thinking, as many of us do at that age, about who am I going to be, what, my life, what kind of human being am I going to be, what's my life going to look like, what's my identity, and was never considered myself a Buddhist, but was thinking along those lines and studying a bit and thinking about suffering and compassion. I had my epiphany at a bar. Tovar had his on a lake. It happened fishing one day, as he did regularly since childhood. But for some reason, this particular fish he reeled in made him question. I didn't have to do that. I could have eaten something else. I didn't have to kill that particular fish. I could have had rice and vegetables or whatever. That was his turning point. Next thing you know, he's a vegan. And I stayed in that mode for most of a decade as a pretty strict vegan. And a few things shifted that, that, that started to open up a new, new direction for me. One was that I realized that as a vegetarian or even a vegan, I still had quite a footprint. Ecologically, I had still had quite a footprint in terms of animal life and death. One of the things that shifted his perspective was realizing his quaint, organic Vermont strawberry farmer shoots deer to protect the crop from damage. That was disturbing to me because I had this notion that as a vegan, I was really separate from that and had sort of purified my diet of all animal death and had separated myself from those, those cycles and those patterns of predation and killing. And there's blood on those berries. It is, you know? Started to recognize all this gray. Yeah, there's still black and yeah, there's still white, but there's all this gray here <laughs> in between. This is another example of the fallacy of dichotomy. Western thought, particularly formed through Abrahamic religions, has taught us to think dualistically. Good or evil, liberal or conservative, body or soul, stones or beetles, and vegetarian or carnivore. But that's fiction. As Tovar points out, real life happens in between the black and white, within the variations of gray. One thing that I go back to is what Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist teacher says, Zen Buddhist master says about mindfulness and about looking deeply at anything. It could be something we're eating, uh, could be the, the paper that makes up the book that his words are printed on. And he suggests, look at that piece of food, that bread, that orange, that piece of paper, and think about what's there. Look deeply into it. And in the paper, well, there's trees. And therefore, there's rain and sun and the land where that tree grew and the logger who harvested that and the mill where that wood was processed into paper. And the same thing with food. You know, where did it come from? And what were all the sort of the elements and the people, all the beings and elements and places involved in having that come to our plates or our bookshelf? Or, and it's almost impossible to know that about everything because of the world we live in today, right? I mean, whether it's our clothing, you know, or our electronics or our food, it's, it's insanely complex. And, and incredibly overwhelming. It is. It, it, you just, you, you blow a circuit in your brain <laughs> trying to, you never find out all the supply chains and sources of all of this stuff. I have no illusions personally that I'm going to accomplish that with like all my food let alone anything else in my life. You know, it's not going to happen. However, I think it's really, it's valuable for me. And I think it has, you know, ecological merit too, to have at least some portion of my diet or other materials in my life, you know, of my food. 
I know where that grew, you know, this garden or the farmer that I know who you know, lives 20 miles away or that venison from that deer that I killed in that place and to really know exactly where those things come from. And so do you, do you remember that, that moment with pretty crystal clarity to this day? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And even like pulling the trigger moments. Yeah, well I remember, you know, when I took my first deer and I was in a state of shock for hours. I mean, there was such a deep well of grief for me. Here's this beautiful, beautiful animal, a big mammal, and now it's a dead body and uh, really didn't know, given what it felt like and the uncertainty and the shock and the grief. I didn't know if I'd ever, ever want to do that again. But going through the process of butchering that deer and bit by bit, you know, leg by leg, taking that body apart, that was actually very meditative in a strange way. It felt very familiar, like almost like a genetic memory or something like, okay, this is how this goes. This is just part of life. You know, it felt really familiar. And, and, and when you eat that deer or any deer, I'm assuming that there is that instant pathway to gratitude. Oh, right. Comes I mean, this is it. like, you think, about, you think about saying grace at a meal. I mean, you take a package out of a freezer and you look at that package, it's not something from some supermarket somewhere or, you know, or some anonymous animal from some anonymous place. This is packaged and you know exactly not only where it came from, but you were, you know with a cost, of, you know, that life and it's immediate. There were many layers to Tovar's making that shift from vegan to hunter, but his values in that process never changed. Only his perspective. Hunting isn't foreign to my family. I mean, we are from Idaho after all. However, no one would have ever thought, including me, that the black sheep in Brooklyn would become one too. But like Tovar, I've gone through some level shifting and I have a new perspective of my own. And now here I am, weapon safety certified with a hunting license in hand, ready to confront what I'm eating, consciously and directly. Hello, fellow provocateurs that believe death is a topic worth talking about. We need your help spreading the word. Be the slightly odd yet endlessly fascinating conversationalist at your next party and tell your friends about the adventures of Memento Mori. Have show ideas? Contact us on our site, remembertodie.com. Be sure to stay up to date with the quest for enlightenment on Instagram and Twitter by following at Remember to Die. And now, back to the show. One, two, three. Brandon, tell me something about yourself. I'm fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I'm out of shape. <laughs> that is a little true. I recorded that clip with my cousin Brandon while we were resting for a minute after a pretty intense hike. As soon as I stopped recording, Brandon noticed what looked like to be a silhouette of an elk on top of the next ridge over. Through my binoculars, I could see it was a horse, and on top of that horse was a cowboy waving his arms, putting his spread fingers to the side of his head and then pointing into the draw just 20 feet to our right. You didn't have to be an expert in cowboy charades to know exactly what he was saying. My heart jumped into my throat. I unslung my rifle and crept as quietly but as quickly as I could to the edge of the draw. 
I moved my body slowly, just enough to see into the draw. And there he was, a mule deer buck, 300 yards up, looking straight back at me. There was no way for me to get closer without spooking him, so I lowered into the most stable crouching position I could get into. I placed the butt of my rifle into my shoulder, and after a moment, found him again in the crosshairs of my scope, still looking straight back at me. Here was the moment I came all of this way for. Breathe in. Breathe out. Sight alignment. Sight picture. But how steep was the draw? How do I account for the trajectory shooting up at this steep angle at 300 yards? As I was doing this Kentucky math in my head, my foot slipped on a loose rock and thankfully sobered me from the adrenaline. And in that instant, I remembered the advice from Stephen Ronella. There should be no doubt what will happen when you squeeze the trigger. And I had doubt. Yeah, so I was brought up as a hunter and fisherman. My father was a very avid outdoorsman. Uh, we ate a lot of wild game and, and just were, were generalist hunters and anglers in West Michigan. Back with meat eater Stephen Ronella. We hunted everything, fished everything, to the point where like, I would have a guilty conscience if I didn't go out. If the family went out hunting and I didn't go out, I would have a guilty conscience. I imagine it's similar to how people might view like if you you know, if, if you were brought up in a church-going household and everyone went to church and you didn't go, you might have this, like, sense of guilt. At a young age, Ronella wanted to make a living as a professional trapper. But because of the drop-off in the fur market and international economics, that wasn't going to happen. So he made the next logical step. Journalism. And then I kind of had a sort of niche specialty in uh writing about the out of doors to people who weren't familiar with it, right? So, uh, you know, I did, you know, a thing for the New Yorker, the New York Times, Glamour, oh, the Oprah magazine, right? Where I'm sort of like explaining this world to people who are perhaps maybe even a little bit suspicious of it, right? That turned into books, which turned into TV shows, podcasts, and much, much more. Coming up with the, with the show idea, Meat Eater. And it's funny because, like, I think people hear that word and they think I'm getting at something I'm not, honestly. I think people now think it's like I'm making some like proclamation about what one ought to eat. But um, I put an enormous amount of energy into growing vegetables in my garden too. So I think that it's create, it's kind of become its own thing. Yeah, now, I know? think it I wasn't think what I intended. You right? would naturally think that that's sort of, you're strictly this paleo. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. I have more, um, I get more veggie cravings than, than meat cravings, but we do. Like in my household, we eat a lot of wild game, and we eat a strict, wild, you know, a pretty strict wild game diet at home. You, know, you can't control what happens, you know, in the restaurants. I'll eat. Do you do you do any? Do you ask if what the source of the meat is? Do you go that far? No, but I know enough about what I'm looking at. You know, like there's some things I would never do, and this is where, like, if once you get to have a nuanced understanding of what, like, wildlife and what wildlife needs to thrive. And then you understand a little bit about agriculture definitely influences my decision making. Take, for example, the nuance of the American buffalo. Right now, the fashionable estimate of how many buffalo or bison were in this country at the time of European contact was somewhere maybe around 40 million. We knocked it back to less than 1,000 through market hunting. Now we've built it back up to where we have 500,000 in North America. One could argue that the buffalo is still ecologically extinct. They're not functioning on the American plains like they once were. However, the reason they're not genetically extinct is because private holders have stepped up to start rebuilding the population. In addition to that, many of the indigenous plains tribes are getting involved in raising buffalo in a free-range environment. So when I go into a restaurant and I see that item on the menu, I'm damn sure going to order that item because I actually support that industry because I understand that industry's importance to, in some way, putting the animal back on the landscape. I typically would have used the opposite rationale. If there are a limited number of buffalo in America, then I'm not going to eat that individual burger because I'm contributing to the overall decline. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about individuals. I will go out, like, we eat a lot of wild turkeys. 
I will go out and, and, and kill wild turkeys, individual wild turkeys. So I'm mechanically removing individual wild turkeys through hunting, which I then feed my family. And I don't see that as a harm because I'm tracking the general turkey nest that's going on in this world. Like we're doing great with turkey. We've done tremendous work to recover the turkey. The turkey's in a very healthy position. So I don't feel bad or morally conflicted about removing individual turkeys. Like I, like I look at it like that just because I have sort of an understanding of, of how wildlife goes and also with fisheries. But, you know, I, I'm able to, just because of the people I know and the time I'm able to spend studying this stuff, when I look at like a, me, a fish menu, I'm able to understand what I'm doing. And, and uh, is, does geography have a lot to do with that? Yeah, it has a lot to do with it. Like if you're in the, the East Coast and you see a West Coast animal or fish, does, does that make you suspect? Well, it's more like species-wide, and it changes so much. So um, there's a lot of depleted stocks of fisheries. You know, you remember, when, you remember years ago when like Orange Ruffy yeah. became very popular? Yeah. Like Orange Ruffy flooded the market because they found a new way to, like kind of a better way to catch Orange Ruffy, you know? It's like just with, with nets that could be controlled in the way where you can almost like scrape contours on the bottom of the ocean with nets, right? And so all of a sudden we, had, we just reached a point where we just like really overfished the thing. Right now, I, I know like a very sustainable hook and line fishery or whatever. Like I look at black cod in a restaurant. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to order that. I just know it's a sustainable fishery. And, and I have like warm, fuzzy feelings about it. So that, that was a long-winded way of saying that <laughs> I eat mostly wild game. I will eat food in restaurants. When I'm in a restaurant, I am like running calculations in my head. And I'm, and I'm thinking about what I'm doing. Did you know, since the Lacey Act of 1900, restaurants can't sell wild game? And if you see elk, moose, or alligator on the menu, it's a farm-raised animal. Did you know the reason we had to stop selling wild game in this country is because in the late 1800s and early 1900s, we systematically eliminated many species of wildlife through market hunting. So in the U.S., we, ha we have some principles around wildlife management that wildlife, for instance, is publicly owned, that it's administered on the state level by 50 fish and game agencies who are legally bound to manage wildlife in perpetuity. We have like a very beautiful, tight system in place here in the US, and it is to the credit of hunters that we have it, if you look at how this whole thing's been structured. Recovering habitats and wildlife took the effort of two presidents and a unified Congress. Theodore Roosevelt began to address the habitat issue, which was key. He was like, if we're going to have, if we're going to recover American wildlife, we need to have a place for it to happen. And he started to address habitat. That guy set aside about 50,000 acres of land for every day that he was in office. He was a hunter. He loved to hunt, and he was worried about, be, be, through, through hunting, he had developed an intense ap appreciation for wildlife and a very intimate understanding of wildlife and understood that. The second step was like the animals themselves. And, and this is a very, like this is a 101 crash course on how this went down, was handled with Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt needed to find money to restore American wildlife. And he knew that the only place that he was gonna get it was from the outdoorsman. And he went around, like honestly went around to the rod and gun clubs around America and said, if you people want wildlife, to even aspire to be a hunter or to aspire to be a fisherman, you will have to pay for it. And in the 1930s, Congress passed the Wildlife Restoration Act that imposed an excise tax on all hunting equipment. That tax funds American wildlife to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. The 50 state fish and game agencies in this country that manage wildlife, so states are in charge of their own wildlife, with the exception of things that are covered under the Threatened and Endangered Species Act or migratory wildlife. The rest is just administered by the states. The states get their funding from the excise taxes on hunting equipment, and the rest comes from the sale of hunting licenses, tags, and stamps. When you look and you see like this hunter and you're kind of mad about like what his role is, you need to understand that since the 30s, for 80 years, we have been footing the bill to restore and recover American wildlife, which we have done very effectively. The colonization of America brought with it devastation to the wildlife and habitats. Luckily, we had a couple presidents named Roosevelt who recognized our negative impact and came up with the conservation system 
that is the envy of the world. Hunters, not bird watchers, hikers, campers, or mountain climbers, fund 100% of state and federal wildlife conservation. Yet they also bear the cultural burden of being the great destroyers. Is this a fair stereotype? Do I now self-identify as a hunter? The conclusion of Eating Eyes Open after this. Do you consider yourself a fan of podcasts? Show it by donating to the Adventures of Memento Mori. Donate $10 or more and we'll mail you a surprise Memento Mori keepsake. $100 or more will give you a post-credit shout-out to let the world know how much you mean to us. Go to remembertodie.com slash donate. That's remembertodie.com slash donate. It's the morning of day three. On the bumpy drive up to the top of the mountain, I let the deck roll on a conversation I was having with my cousin Matt and my buddy Sven. If I shoot a buck, every time I'm, I'm gonna eat some of that meat, I know exactly, I mean, I practically looked him in the eyes from some dif- uh, distance and I know exactly what I'm eating and I would never waste any of that meat and this is, not a buck, it's, it's the buck that I'm eating. And that's that's the big difference if if you had to kill what you eat. You know, when you say look the animal in the eye, it, it's, from my perspective, it's, it's pulling the trigger, I think, is the hardest part. You know, I don't, I don't find any joy in killing the animal. And I think maybe, <clears throat> You know, talking about again about people that eat meat but don't are are, are anti hunting. Like I said yesterday, I think some people just see a sort of savagery in that and maybe conjure up these images of somebody out there with a high powered rifle shooting an animal and, and the blood and the guts and all, all that. And I think that people just can't wrap their head around that, probably because they just couldn't fathom themselves doing it because it's so foreign to them. Um, and then also I think there's just that negative perception about hunting and, and there's there's a maybe a population of hunters that are hunting unethically that maybe drives that perception but I, but I can't I just for the life of me I can't think of any other reason why you'd be anti-hunting but still eat meat An interesting thing began to happen once I started to share with people my intent to hunt. There was the expected ethical conversations with vegetarians and vegans, which I was happy to have. There was the expected simplistic identity politics. If I hunt, therefore I trump. But surprisingly, there was major shade thrown from people who ate meat. At one point, I was called an animal murderer while somebody was literally eating a cheeseburger. I love to discuss these issues with people who are morally sound. So if, you're a, if you've decided that it's just categorically wrong, it's categorically wrong to kill an animal for human purposes, I respect that and I, would, and I welcome the chance to have that conversation with people because I feel like in some ways I'm in the same position where I'm doing something from a well thought out angle. If you eat meat but then hate hunters, like you've done such a you've done such a little amount like like a like a, such a paltry amount of sort of introspection on the issue that it's not fun for me to talk to you i don't even know where to begin engaging in it it's not really interesting it's just kind of like dumb it's dumb in that it lacks logic and rational thought and more importantly it speaks to the cultural denial of death involved in our consumption of food that is not to say however that all hunters are introspective and are doing the right thing. There, there are bad players. There are bad players out there. Just like in every aspect of the world, every pastime, every industry. I'm not gonna sit here and whitewash this and tell you that there's not bad shit that happens. You do not need to look far to find it. Part of what I like to do, like if I'm gonna find like a, like a, a goal from my life is that I would, in addition to trying to do other things, try to speak to those people who are bad players. 
speak to those people who have behavior and practices that I think are destructive and inspire them to be otherwise, to do otherwise. Today is day four. Sven shot a buck last night. So, the trip has been a success on that level. Now everybody is hoping and expecting that I shoot one today. I only have a couple hours left. We're in a new position. Right now I'm lying prone position in the straw, looking up at two does about 150 yards away, waiting to see if there's a buck somewhere nearby. So I'm just gonna sit here and wait. I didn't take a deer on that hunt, but I was there when Sven did. And although I wasn't the one who pulled the trigger, I witnessed the dressing and the butchering of the animal. I even had a discreet ceremony in reverence. Do I identify as a hunter? Only as much as I went hunting, will go hunting again next year and have a profound respect for when it's done right. Sven was generous enough to give me a large portion of the deer which was my exclusive source of meat, for the next six months. But that's still five months away from the next hunting season. Hey! How you good. good! Finally, after all this time! Yeah, nice to meet Not only do I find a sustainable farm near me, but I also found one that's a non-profit and run by a nun. My name is Margot Morris, and I am a member of the Society of the Sacred Heart, so a religious sister. We're gonna go right in here. How many acres are out here? 200. 200. Yeah. 200 and um, we, there are a lot of different ecosystems. Oh, oh, <laughs> what do you call a baby? Kid. Oh, what's up kid? Hi. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh yeah, just lean over, you'll see a few more. And they're all over the place, so. You guys are cute. The 200 acre farm is called Sprout Creek, and its mission is to educate the public, particularly children, on all aspects of biodiversity and farming. These are, this is all cow over here um, in this area, and this is where the cows get milked. Um, see the stainless steel pipe up above? Yeah. yeah. And so as far as their diet's concerned, it's, it's, all, it's all grasses. It's all grasses. No, what no, no corns. No corn. Doing my best Portlandia impression, I made sure that the farm practiced rotational grazing, that the animals were treated humanely, and that it was symbiotic. So, I mean, we, we, do, we need to think in terms of life and death being part of how this whole planet transforms itself, continuously transforms itself. Um, and... and manages its existence. And we tend to interrupt that. Um, and we need to understand it better. So death isn't the end. It's just we become something else. Everything becomes something else that contributes, it's, we hope. It's part of the greater whole. That's it. That's, it. The whole, that's how it works. The planet works like that. Always has. Go think about that. Yeah. Put that in your pipe. <laughs> Put that in your podcast and smoke it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Oh. In the span of two years, I went from vigilant vegan to mindful hunter to an obnoxious Brooklynite who tries his best to know where his food comes from and rants about dichotomies. I doubt I'll ever be able to understand the web of nature as well as Stephen Ornella, but like Tovar says, it's important to at least try. And as far as ethics are concerned, a poem of Wislawa Zimborska's In Praise of Self-Deprecation comes to mind. It ends. For me, 
Eating meat is ethical when one does three things. First, you accept the biological reality that death begets life on this planet and that all life, including us, is really just solar energy temporarily stored in an impermanent form. Second, you combine this realization with the cherished human trait of compassion and choose ethically raised food, vegetable, grain, and or meat. And third, you give thanks. If you live in the New York City area and want to buy your food from a nun-run farm that's symbiotic, go to Sprout Creek. Or just take your kids on a field trip. If you don't live in New York, but would still like to go to a sustainable farm, go to the website eatwild.com and search for one near you. Thanks for joining me on another episode of The Adventures of Memento Mori. Thanks to Lear Keith, Ben Wargaft, Jay Bost, Tovar Cerulli, Margot Morris, Sven, Brandon, Matt, Rita Nakuzi, and Stephen Ronella. For links to all the wonderful work they do, please go to RememberToDie.com. I'm D.S. Moss. See you the next time for more The Adventures of Memento Mori. The episode was produced by Josh Heilbronner, D.S. Moss, and Hannah Beal. Theme music composed by Mikey Ballou. This has been a production of the Jones Story Company. Until the next time, remember to die.